I was co-pilot on a B-17, returning from a successful bombing mission. We'd been hit by very light flak, but there was no serious damage. Nothing to do now but relax for the long bus ride home. Our flight engineer was checking the plane and the crew, and everyone was taking things easy. Looking for excitement, huh? Yes, maybe the ride home was pretty dull. But from that moment on, there was plenty of excitement. We got a bad leak in the left-hand tank. Check on those gauges. Check. About 400 gallons. It's just pouring now. Pilot to navigator. Pilot to navigator. Navigator to pilot. Go ahead. We've got about 400 gallons of gas, but we're losing a lot. Can we get home? We're okay, Skipper. Strong tailwind. Drift constant. Now just take the depth of position check. Nothing to worry about. The wind's constant and our DR's okay. We'll make it easy. How about sending a message anyway? Oh, why get the boys back at the roost all excited with an SOS? With this tailwind, we can coast in with no gas at all. I was kind of worried about the whole setup. It looked pretty dangerous. But the skipper knew his business. After all, we'd come through things worse than this. Then I noticed number two tank was empty. We couldn't trust the luck any longer. Look, maybe we'd better get... Oh, forget it, Reynolds. Hey, Reynolds, the gunners realized something was wrong. They hurried to the radio room. Pilot to radio operator. Pilot to radio operator. Start pounding that key. Get our position. Send a report. Just a few more questions, Reynolds. Yes, sir. Why couldn't the navigator and the bombardier escape? The nose caved in. They were killed on impact. The nose caved in? They should have been in the radio compartment with the gunners. What about them? They never got out, sir. The hatch must have jammed. And it wasn't open in advance. Our radio report shows that only one faint signal came through. Were sending conditions that bad? Well, I couldn't say, sir. We, we were just starting a send when we crashed, so we didn't get many off. Lieutenant Harris and the pilot were sure we'd make it all right. Was the emergency equipment satisfactory? I'm afraid we didn't have much time to use it, Captain, after we hit the water. Besides, we, we weren't sure where it was stowed. Didn't you ever have dinghy drill? Well, we've always been pretty busy. We never had much time for it. Didn't you ever suppose that something might happen to you and the others? Well, you know how guys are. We, we always figured we had the Indians sign on. Bad luck. Yes, I know. Ten men went out. One came back. You men always think that the other fellow, the other plane, not you, is the one that's going to get it, so why worry? Well, nine of you were wrong. I understand you're going back to the States, Reynolds. Yes, sir. Well, I hope if you get your own crew and your own ship, Lieutenant, you'll remember those boys that are still out there in that drink, the guys who didn't come back. That's all. Scotty, where do I drop my eggs today? No flying today. Fargo with a practice target. Well, if that's the case, I've got a date. Sorry, Ed, we're going to have dinghy drill. Dinghy dr Are you kidding? I'll meet you all at the ship, and that includes you, Hendricks. Nixon, bring your equipment. What is this, the Army or the Navy?
As you men can probably guess from our training, we're going to be doing a lot of flying over open ocean. And if we're ever forced down, it's going to be a pretty long swim home. That's why our ship carries 300 pounds of emergency rescue equipment. Lieutenant Hendricks probably feels that this amount of equipment would do more good in the bomb bay. Well, there are times when an extra bomb comes in mighty handy. But I can tell you from experience that this equipment does too. Or would have if, if our crew had known how to ditch. The two five-man dinghies are located in compartments provided for them in the top of the fuselage. You can see the outline of one of those compartments just behind the top turret. The dinghies in them are released from inside the radio compartment by pulling two blue handles just in front of the escape hatch. On the later B-17s, the dinghies can be released from the outside by two handles to the rear of the compartments. When either set of handles are pulled, the dinghies are automatically inflated and forced out of their compartments, so you don't have to worry about that part of it. All right, men, let's go inside and take a look at the equipment. Brian, give me a hand. We'll take a look at the dinghy first. Okay, fellas, now try to follow this, will you? Because someday it may be very important to you. If for some reason the dinghy doesn't inflate when you pull the automatic handles in the ship, yank the emergency handle like this. Maybe you think this is too delicate for five men to float for a couple of weeks on a rough sea. Well, in case you haven't heard already, men have been known to float for 30 days on one of these rafts and it was still found to be seaworthy. The CO2 in this cylinder here is the same stuff that puts bubbles in your coke. But after you've been afloat for a while, a little of it will begin to leak out. Nothing to worry about, because you'll find a compact and efficient air pump stowed in the life raft kit. It attaches to any one of these four connections. There are two of these life raft kits, one for each dinghy. One is stowed in the radio compartment, the other in the waste compartment. On later model planes, these kits are packed inside the dinghy so you don't have to carry them out separately. Here's the way a life raft kit looks before it's open, and this is what you'll find in it. The signal in case a rescue ship or plane is near, a mirror, which is your best daytime signaling device, a signal kit with pistol and flares, which will serve the same purpose at night, three cans of sea markers, a flashlight that will float with extra batteries, a whistle, a knife, a compass, and matches. Part of your eating and drinking problem will be taken care of by the drinking water and rations in these cans, but depend upon a fishing kit as your main source of supply. Here's a set of instructions in case none of you have ever fished, and here's a net to scoop them up with in case you catch any. Use the first aid kit for sunburn and even slight scratches. And protect yourself from the sun and spray as much as possible with this pollen. Use the blue side to prevent enemy planes from observing you. And the yellow side will aid search parties. But there are times when you want to navigate. You'll find equipment for that in this kit too. Oars, three of them, and with extension pieces. And if a favorable wind ever comes your way, make use of this setup. This is the way the sail pollen looks after it's installed. The mast and boom are simply oars assembled with the extension pieces. Now, in case the wind is wrong and you don't want to sail adrift, you can hold your position fairly well with this sea anchor. Now, there are two pockets in this dinghy. In this pocket, you'll find 40 feet of twine and a bailing bucket. If the enemy happen to throw some slugs into the dinghy, these bullet hole stoppers will come in mighty handy. If you've ever patched an automobile inner tube and can read directions, this repair kit will help keep the dinghy seaworthy. Now, you probably think that you're equipped to last the duration on one of these rubber yachts. But the Army Air Force is determined that you'll always be dressed for the occasion. 
Come here, Hendricks. <laughs> this skull cap may look funny, but it'll keep your head cool and will act as a marker to aid searching parties. <laughs> All right, men, flip it over. Captain Cherry, pilot of the Flying Fortress, which carried Eddie Rickenbacker, reports that a couple of times an exceptionally rough sea turned his raft over. He says the best way to write one of these thingies is to grab the lifeline on the side opposite you. Sergeant, would you do that, please? Don't put your weight on the dinghy, as this will expel the air trapped under it, thus making it more difficult to write. Put your knees against the buoyancy chamber, lift up, and pull over backwards, thus forcing the raft to assume its normal position. This lifeline serves another very important purpose. When you're in the radio compartment, you tie various kits and equipment that you're responsible for to your arm. After you've ditched and you're safely in the dinghy, this equipment should be tied to the lifeline. Then if the dinghy capsizes, none of it will be lost. All right, let's take a look at the radio equipment. It's simple to work. The emergency signal is sent out as long as this handle is turned. All of this is carried out separately. Here's one piece of wearing apparel I hope you spend most of your time sitting on. But in case of an emergency, always bring one of these B4 kits along with you. Remember, if you're ever sweating it out with only an eighth of an inch of rubber fabric between yourself and an ocean full of sharks, the contents of one of these B4 kits is worth its weight in gold. Rescued crews have told of saving their kits only to discover that the contents have been taken by men in the field or eaten by themselves previously. Make sure that this never happens to you. Here's what goes in one of them. Signal flares, signaling mirror, first aid kit, emergency ration pack, fishing kit, machete, goggles, compass, knife, matches, gloves, mosquito netting for the head, water bottle, and last but not least, a comforter. This emergency E5 ration box is painted bright yellow. It's wooden and it floats. It's stowed in the forward left-hand corner of the waist compartment adjacent to the ball turret. It supplements the supplies you find in the other kits. Always draw these extra supplies before every overwater flight, for they mean additional days of medical care, comfort, drinking water, and rations. Don't be surprised at any changes in any one of these kits or the equipment because the Army Air Force is constantly making improvements based on the reports of men who have ditched and lived. Continually check your emergency equipment to make sure it's intact and in working order. Let's go back to the ship. All right, men, get inside, get into your headsets. You know, I, uh, I thought I was through with ground school when I got my wings. Crew from pilot, crew from pilot. Don't forget the pilot's the captain in an emergency even more than at any other time. And he's the one who decides when it'll be necessary to make an emergency landing. Prepare for ditching, prepare for ditching. That's the order, and brother, when you hear it, move. I'll let you know what our altitude is so you'll have some idea of how much time there is. But first, so that I know you'll receive the command, acknowledge it in the following order. Co-pilot first. Roger. Navigator. Navigator, ditching. Bombardier. Bombardier, ditching. Flight engineer. Flight engineer, ditching. Radio operator. Radio operator, ditching. Ball turret gunner. Ball turret gunner ditching. Right waist gunner. Right waist gunner ditching. Left waist gunner. Left waist gunner ditching. Tail gunner. Tail gunner ditching. Remove oxygen masks if below 12,000. Unsnap shoot harness. Remove winter flying boots unless in cold climates, but keep all other clothes on. Loosen collar and take off tie.
Every man in the ship do that now, and any time we drill or prepare to ditch. Let's take a look at my job. And I, in this case, means anybody with pilot wings. I fasten my shoulder harness with the help of the co-pilot. Co-pilot, you simply strap yourself into your shoulder harness. Navigator, you're a busy man. Check our present position, course, speed, and altitude. Then calculate our estimated position of ditching and phone it to the radio operator. Give your pilot surface wind velocity and direction. Destroy secret papers. Pick up your maps and celestial equipment. Then head for the radio compartment. Upon entering the radio compartment, secure the gun. Then remove the top hatch and stow it in the waste compartment. Hendricks, your job as bombardier is to jettison the bombs and loose equipment and destroy the bomb site. If there isn't time to jettison the bombs, make sure they are safe and leave the bomb bay doors closed. Check the front escape hatch as you go back to the radio compartment. And don't forget the first aid kit and the B-4 kit. Flight engineer, get rid of your ammunition right away unless you need it to fight off enemy aircraft. Every ounce you save now means that the ship will fly farther, land slower, and float longer. Lining up your guns forward gives the pilot and the co-pilot handholds to help them in climbing out of their windows. Now head for the radio compartment because there's no safe place to brace yourself where you are. You're the last man in from the front part of the ship, so make sure that the bulkhead door is secure. Those slots along the bomb bay door hinges will let in water just as quickly as air. But the busiest man in the radio compartment is you, the radio operator. You start sending the SOS immediately, along with our position and call sign, the minute you get the first emergency signal from the pilot at the first sign of trouble. You've switched on the liaison transmitter tuned to the MFDF frequency to obtain a fix. Your IFF is turned to distress. Remain on intercom to get any additional information from the navigator once you get the fix. It's a good idea to prepare a new distress signal every half hour of every flight, just in case. Ball turret gunner, point your guns to the rear and get rid of your ammunition. And when you leave the turret, close the entrance as tightly as possible. You take a first aid kit, ration kit, and life raft kit with you to the radio compartment. Right and left waist gunners, get rid of your ammunition, jettison all loose equipment, including guns, in your part of the ship. Then close the windows tightly to help keep the ship afloat as long as possible. Right waist gunner, take a parachute, pick up the emergency radio and signal box, then start for the radio room. Tail gunner, get rid of your ammunition too, and then get out of that tail. It's not a healthy place to be when the ship ditches. Check the rear escape hatch on your way out of the tail. Pick up the emergency ration pack, which is your responsibility. Make sure when the time comes, you get it out of the ship. Check the main door to see that it's secure on your way to the radio compartment. The pilot and the co-pilot's compartment windows are kept closed as there's less chance of them jamming that way. Before the ship hits the water, I order the radio operator to have the other men assume ditching positions just before the crash. Assume your flight positions. I'll come back and we'll do it over again. Now we'll pick it up from the point of entry. Radio operator, you're in your seat sending out the SOS. In later type planes, you would jettison the seat so you'd have more room to assume a prone position just before the crash. First man in is the navigator. He secures the gun. Then he removes the top hatch. and places it in the waste compartment. Next is the bombardier. You take your position in the forward starboard corner facing aft. Third man in is the flight engineer. If operating in theaters where the E-5 kit is provided, he will secure it from the waist and stow it in the aisle. 
He then assists the others in stowing equipment until he assumes his ditching position later on. Next, the ball turret gunner. He seats himself directly in front of the bombardier and crouches up as close as he can get to him. The next man in is the right waist gunner. He seats himself beside the bombardier, assuming the same position. Next man in is the left waist gunner. He seats himself in front of the ball turret gunner, his feet propped up against the aft bulkhead. By this time, the navigator has finished stowing the top hatch, and he seats himself in front of the right waist gunner, assuming the same position. The last man in is the tail gunner. You seat yourself in front of the navigator, and he should stay as far to his left as possible, his legs well drawn up, in order to protect himself in case the upper support of the ball turret should break through this aft door. Now the flight engineer assumes his ditching position, which is prone on his back next to the radio operator's seat, his feet pressed against the forward bulkhead, knees slightly bent to absorb the shock. He cradles his head in his hands, elbows out thrust. Spend whatever time you have available in tying equipment to your arms and patting yourselves to absorb the shock. At the last minute, I order radio operator assume ditching position. The radio operator screws his key down, puts a pad between himself and the radio, and inflates one half of his May West as protection against the edge of the table. He remains on intercom so I can transmit orders to the rest of you. This, then, is the position you assume preceding point of impact on the water. A few seconds before the impact, I order radio operator, brace for ditching. Okay, there's the bell, be ready. Brace for ditching. Don't move until the plane stops. If you do, you're a dead duck. Remember, there are two impacts. One when the tail hits, and a second and a more violent one when the fore part of the plane hits. Now hold these positions, and I'll pick it up from the pilot's compartment. Now we're close. Ready for the landing. The tail hits. Now the belly. Don't move until the ship has come to a dead stop. When it does, we all go into action. Hope for a minute to work in, but remember General Twining's plane. It went down in the South Pacific in less than 30 seconds. You may be luckier than that, or you may not. Here's what happens in the pilot's compartment when the ship stops, and it has to happen fast. The pilot and the co-pilot release their shoulder harness. The pilot and co-pilot both leave through their side windows, which are kept closed during the ditching. There's an axe handy if the window wants to argue with us. We don't inflate our May West until we're sitting on the window ledge, because if we did it before, we'd have about as much chance of getting through that side window as a sausage through a keyhole. Those in the radio compartment may inflate one half of their May West as soon as they get to their feet. In regular ditching, I, as pilot, would go to the left dinghy, take command, and cut the rope. You as the co-pilot would do the same to the right dinghy. Tail gunner, you're the first man out. Then you'll be handed the navigator's equipment. Once out, you inflate the other half of your life vest, but you can skip that now because this is a dry drill. Navigator, you're next. You'll be handed the emergency radio equipment from the right waist gunner. Third man out is that right waist gunner. Take a parachute. Next comes the flight engineer who takes the E-5 kit. Radio operator, you're number five out of the ship. Take a light raft kit. Sixth man out is you, left waist gunner. You should take B-4, first aid kits, and parachute. Ball turret gunner, you're number seven. You take the other life raft kit. You're the only man who doesn't go immediately to his dinghy. You wait to help the bombardier. Hendricks, as bombardier, you're the last man out of the ship. You take the first aid and B-4 kits. Now we're through, and we've ditched properly. But let's see how it would look if we could take away the skin of the ship and see everything going on at the same time. We're out over the Pacific. Gas low, no land in sight. We've got to ditch, so we do it while we still have engines to help us. Prepare for ditching, prepare for ditching. First, jettison ammunition. Top turret gunner fires remaining ammunition. Points guns forward. Bombardier opens bomb bay doors, jettisons bombs. Ball turret guns are fired and pointed to the rear. 
The waste gunners jettison their ammunition, guns, and loose equipment, and tail gunner gets rid of his 50 caliber stuff, too. Everyone except the pilot and co-pilot picks up his assigned equipment and heads for the radio compartment. The pilot will try to land the plane along the crest of the swell parallel to the troughs using not more than half flaps. Just before ditching, the pilot orders the radio operator to assume his ditching position. A few seconds before impact, the pilot orders, brace for ditching. Everyone braces. All right, here it comes. The plane hits the water, tail first, and then the forward part. As soon as it stops, and not before, pull those dinghy release handles. Everyone gets out fast. Pilot and co-pilot through the side hatches to opposite dinghies. The others through the top hatch in the radio compartment by pairs to their appointed dinghies. Notice the rafts were taken past the flaps so the torn metal won't rip them. It won't always work this way because ships vary and emergencies arise that you can't always anticipate in advance. That's why each crew must practice and learn their own ditching drill. Well, that's it. But remember, no matter how well you know your procedure, it doesn't do any good if your equipment isn't in top condition and stowed properly. Make a complete and thorough inspection before every overwater flight. That means checking the dinghies, checking the emergency provision kits, and checking the emergency radio equipment. Disconnect the CO2 cables from the dinghies and pull the two blue dinghy release handles in the radio compartment to make sure that they'll release quickly. Your drill was okay, except you all made one mistake. You should loosen anything tight around your neck. In this case, you forgot to unbutton your collars and take off your ties. Well, I guess that just about finishes us here. Honey, I'm on my way. Change your clothes, get your equipment, and report to the mock-up for a wet drill. A wet what? A wet drill. Getting out of the ship is your main job. No one will argue with you about that. But getting yourself and your equipment in the raft safely is equally important. If possible, launch the dinghy from the end of the wing to avoid tearing it on the flaps which may be damaged by the landing. And step in, don't jump. That rubber isn't steel flooring. You okay, Johnny? All set, Scotty. Don't leave the area of the ship until it sinks. During daylight, it'll help you get spotted, or another plane from your formation can report your position from it. As soon as you've checked that all the men are safe and sound, take stock of what equipment you've got. Now, you all know what a lifesaver the B-4 kit is, but the parachute proper can be plenty useful, too. It can be used as protection against the sun, wind, spray, rain, or as a sail to propel a boat, or any one of a dozen uses you can dream of. But remember, the most important item is your own common sense. That means doing things like checking your shoes to see that there are no nails that can shake the dinghy, or seeing that any curling seams are immediately cemented down. Another thing, take simple exercise to keep your blood circulating. You can do it individually or collectively. <laughs> <laughs> but don't kill yourself in your enthusiasm. Remember, you're fighting to survive. If you're spotted by a rescue plane, don't give yourself a Roman holiday and eat up all your rations, because it may be days before actual help comes. I have all seen how to ride an inverted dinghy on land. Let's row back to the mock-up and we'll show you how it's done in the water. Easy, wasn't it? But remember, what I've told you is a procedure under ideal conditions. Sometimes things will go wrong. A man might be injured or equipment damaged. Then you've got to improvise. It may even require an exchange in ditching positions. That's why it's so important for everyone to know each other's duties. And of course, you, you don't have to be told that wounded men come before any equipment. Well, that's it for today. Is that all, Captain? Yes, Lieutenant, that's all. We'll hold our next drill tomorrow if the target is still closed in. Dingy Dan. <laughs> Jab cruise.
closer by now. Sing out when you sight her. Okay, Scotty, I'm all warmed up. Hey, Scotty, that Jeff Cruz is down there waiting for us.
It took us 30 seconds to get into the life rafts. And our plane sank 15 seconds later. We sat there watching it disappear into the sea. We weren't scared because we realized a simple truth. All the long hours of drill had paid off in that one terrible moment when we ditched. At first, it looked like we were a million miles from nowhere. We took stock of our rations and equipment, sent up the balloon with the aerial for the dinghy radio. With that radio, we knew we weren't lost. It was our lifeline to the outside world. We hoisted our sails and headed for the nearest port. What port? Well, if our navigator could steer us around the sky, he could do the same on the sea. Our radio was sending out a steady SOS that was bound to be picked up. Then a wind came up and it started to get cold. So we exercised and warmed our bodies. We were getting hungry by now. Our rations took care of that. Ointment from the first aid kits helped our sunburned faces. There wasn't a man among us who wasn't grateful. But the skipper had continually checked all the emergency kits. Our radio operator kept grinding away. We looked for rescue planes, but all we saw was storm clouds headed our way. We took down the sails. Then over the whine of the rising wind, we thought we heard the sound of a plane. The skipper fired a signal flare. And the sky answered with thunder and lightning, the driving rain. swell to watch the warm sun break through the dark clouds. But it didn't compare with the thrill of seeing that rescue plane. We helped those guys spot us with the pollens and the sea marker. We were going to be saved. But it wasn't luck. We worked for it. The skipper was right. You know how prepared for it. You can ditch and live. Anything else, Lieutenant? Nothing else, sir. Except that you should know there's only one man responsible for bringing us through, Captain Reynolds. Fine. Well, I guess that's about all, Lieutenant. Thanks a lot. Thank you, sir. Your second ditching, eh, Reynolds? Yes, sir. Evidently, you learned something from the first. Sit down. Your bombardier regards you as an expert. You mean Hendricks? Yes, just before you came in, I heard the whole story. Hey, what happened, Dan? Oh, nothing much. We got a new ship, and because we're so hot, we're gonna get the whole day off. And by an odd coincidence, I have a date with a lady Marie. Hey, hey just a second, Skipper. Uh, men have taken a vote and delegated me to remind you of something. Yeah, what? Well, we haven't had ditching drill for over a week. I, I mean, not since we hit the drink. Oh. We'd like to have one right now. Oh, now look, fellas, cut it out, will you? I got. Oh, 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 hey, oh. hey, wait! Remember your slogan: forget the women and prepare for ditching. Come on! Come on, 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 on. on.